Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about the cache and forward architecture. Um, let me give the background motivation of why we are uh, doing this work. Uh, the internet, which was designed several decades ago, was designed for conversation between computers, which were wired, and they were connected uh, over uh, this backbone network, uh, strictly over wired, uh, wired interfaces. However, now the uh, main application of the internet is the main application of the, uh, 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 which is basically used in the internet, is content uh, retrieval, and that too, uh, using mobile and wireless devices. However, when we do this content retrieval, we only do it uh, as if it was a conversation. We still do it as if it's a, it's a conversation. There is a link connection. There is a, a single link uh, going from each user uh, to the uh, server which is providing the service. So as such, uh, as these number of users increases, the load on the network increases a lot. Um, so uh, again, uh, further motivating the idea of uh, future internet, uh, wireless and video are going to be the key features. Uh, there are already a very large number of uh, mobile and wireless devices connecting to the network and uh, much more is predicted for future years. Uh, there are many more applications than they were in the past. There is no conversation. There is mostly mobile data retrieval, some sensor network applications, vehicular applications, and so on. Content distribution is the um, main uh, uh, source of band uh, bandwidth consumption on the internet today. So therefore, the uh, focus uh, for a future internet design should be on efficient dis dis dissemination of content to mobile and wireless devices. That's because we don't want to talk anymore. We just want to watch movies. So um, again, uh, so future internet uh, scenarios would include mobile, uh, wireless mesh, vehicular, and sensor networks. These are mainly characterized by uh, time-varying links, intermittent uh, connectivity, uh, low power considerations. Um, all this requires opportunistic transport, cross-layer design, uh, some caching capability, and a lot of computation within the network. Uh, the requirement for uh, the large, the high requirement for content, there is a, a big thirst for uh, just movies and data and, and, and large files from the network, and therefore there is a need for caching within the network to make the uh, content retrieval more efficient. Uh, so caching and opportunity transport are coming out to be the key themes, uh, but fortunately the semiconductor memory cost is reducing and is, uh, is going to further reduce in the future. And the uh, processing uh, power is also available at much lower prices. So therefore we want to design a network based on a concept that uh, storage will be available on all routers. So lots of storage. And therefore, we can pr uh, provide uh, or, or come up with protocols that use the storage information for optimization for wireless and mobility, as well as for content. So large buffers for link layer uh, optimizations, temporary storage for network layer, cache for in network caching applications, and so on. This could actually be a distributed data center. You don't really need a big data center down in Arizona. You can just put everything within the network and save uh, a, a space, energy, and everything. In an ideal world, we could replace all the routers with uh, uh, CNF routers, which are cache and forward routers with storage capability. Of course, in the real world, we'll have to do an incremental deployment. And in the meanwhile, we could think about an overlay of uh, cache and forward routers. So what does this cache and forward architecture look like? Well, so it, produce, it, it uh, uh, proposes a whole bunch of uh, optimizations for wireless, so hub-by-hub uh, -hub transport and storage-aware routing. For, uh, to support the uh, mobile users who can get disconnected or would have uh, s slower connections to the uh, network. And for content, we propose in-network caching and content name resolution and cache management policies. Um, we also uh, notice that there are a lot of disconnections when you are connecting to the internet, and therefore we introduce a concept of post office, which is very similar to the USPS post office. Uh, they hold your mail whenever you are away. So similarly, let's say that content is being transported from a media server to the uh, mobile user, and the user gets disconnected because it moves away or something. The file which was in trans transit could be stored in an intermediate router, and an entity called a post office could be informed. Now, this post office could be something similar to a home agent in a mobile uh, uh, IP network. Uh, the post office maintains the information of this temporary storage, and uh, 
when the user comes back and connects maybe somewhere else in the network, it can query the post office for the location of this uh, uh, stored file. Now, depending upon which copy of the file is near the user, now uh, the, the file could be retrieved either from the stored temporary stored place or from the server or from a local cache. So here's the protocol stack. Um, we are building on top of the Phi and Mac. Uh, we have a reliable link protocol, a storage aware routing protocol, and a hop by hop transport. We are proposing to um, we're actually providing a content pull service as well as uh, content push in both unicast and multicast mode. Uh, we also have content routing, uh, cache management, and content naming services. Uh, we're working on uh, all, all these different layers. So uh, going more details in the hub by hub transport protocol, uh, as you see, the file goes from the server to the mobile user uh, in a hub by hub fashion. So the entire file is sent to the next router before it can be forwarded. This is completely uh, opposite to the end-to-end -end connection where uh, there is uh, the, the, bits, the bits flow from one uh, end to the other uh, in, in, a, in, in, in a pipeline fashion. Um, now, end-to-end -end acknowledgments are also exchanged so that uh, the, uh, f the file transfer is reliable. However, the transport protocol doesn't take care of per hop reliability. We move that concept to the link layer. Uh, and I'll explain what, uh, how it happens in the, in the next slide. But before that, uh, let's say when, when this file was delivered, it wasn't delivered completely. Uh, because hop by hop transport provides a natural uh, and easy way for caching, uh, an incomplete file could be completed by asking for data from an intermediate router instead of going all the way down to the server. So to support the hop by hop protocol, uh, transport protocol, we have a reliable link protocol that takes care of uh, per hop reliability. So when when the entire file is sent to the next hop, it could it it should it makes sure that the next hop receives it completely. So uh, what we do is we take the file, we uh, break it down into batches of smaller packets, and then each pa batch is transmitted in uh, a reliable fashion. And there are just a simple control and acknowledgement messages which are exchanged to make sure that uh, all the, all the uh, packets within the batch are delivered. So I, I showed how batch 0 was delivered, and then batch 1 gets delivered after batch 0 is completely delivered. The next uh, uh, important uh, point and, and, and quite interesting uh, 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 design was this um, soft, uh, storage aware routing protocol. It's very different from the current, uh, any current uh, implementation of routing because it just not, not just uses the current cost of the route to uh, send data from, uh, to, to decide, uh, decide the forwarding route, but it also looks at the history of the, uh, of the route and also uh, the storage available along the route. So we maintain storage availability along all routers in the network. We maintain the current cost of the uh, route, and we maintain a moving average, which is a very simple heuristic to do a moving average. But that could be uh, we could also do some kind of pattern detection. So in any case, whatever method we use, uh, we could maintain a historical representation of the link cost, and then use those these three different parameters to decide what is the best way to send the data. Now, of course, if we use a shortest path routing protocol, there is no concept of history because if a path is four hops in length, it will always be four hops in length. Uh, because that particular path will be four hops in length. If, if it increases in, in length, then that's a different route altogether. So that, that's why we uh, think about uh, metrics which are more uh, time, which, which uh, capture the uh, concept of time variation. So for example, uh, the link rate. Uh, or link speeds, the uh, let's say queuing delays in the uh, wired network and contention. These could be parameters that determine the history of the route. Um, we, we map the short term and long term uh, cost in a two dimensional space, and then we say if the short term and long term are almost the same, then that seems to be a stable route. So if a, if a, a route falls within that classification, we say let's let's send the data without any uh, uh, delay. Now. If it happens, if it so happens that the short-term cost is much larger than the long-term average, then we can say that maybe this route will improve in the future. So instead of using a suboptimal path, we store the data temporarily in our uh, abundant storage space available in the router. Um, on the other hand, if the short-term cost is much lower than the long-term cost, we would want to use this path as opportunistically as possible. Um, 
keeping uh, no, these are not the only things which we consider but we also the most important thing that we consider is storage availability so for example it doesn't matter where the route uh, uh, how the route is classified if there is uh, the storage available in the in in the downstream path is too low then we don't want to overload the path and so we anyway would store and wait until the uh, downstream storage is cleared that sort of uh, brings in a flow control in the network layer, which is not a very well-known concept, and we're introducing that here. We implemented the hub-by-hub -hub transport and a routing protocol in orbit, and uh, here's the architecture. There is a hub-by-hub -hub transport, which works on top of UDP packets, or UDP sockets. Uh, we develop a, a storage module, which keeps track of, uh, its, uh, it, of all the files that are in transit. We implement the storage aware routing on top of OLSR. Uh, we implement the forwarding algorithm as a plugin, so it can be changed, and some sort of uh, any any other so, uh, kind of forwarding algorithm can be implemented on top of it. The routing protocol manipulates the kernel routing table so that the uh, store and forward decisions are conveyed to uh, any application which is running on top. Um, we found that the uh, uh, the system works very well in uh, mesh networks. We get 30% performance improvement uh, compared to TCP. And we especially get more uh, benefit when the uh, links are time varying or they're disconnected. So in summary, we, get, uh, we, we have done a lo loads of simulations and we have uh, done lots of experiments in orbit. And uh, I, I only presented a summary of these things. We have two papers, uh, uh, one of them under submission, and another paper which won our best paper award just a few uh, weeks ago uh, in a workshop. Um, in all our results, we found that we get 30% or more improvement over TCP as well as UDP. Um, right now, we are working on implementation uh, on the WiMAX uh, network. We want to extend this so that uh, it works from Wi-Fi to WiMAX, and then from wired networks to Wi-Fi and to WiMAX to, to give a seamless routing protocol across the three networks. Um, we, also, uh, we are also working on uh, a full-blown CNF architecture imp implementation. We, we are working on uh, the caching aspect, the addressing, and the content management and content naming aspects also. That's it. Any questions? Yes. Um, will content owners have any issues with the long-term caching of content on the routers? So if it is a, a if, if that is a digital rights management issue, so if a content owner uh, is required to be paid for a content, then the digital rights have to be managed uh, through the through the router or through another entity. So uh, we will, uh, uh, we would say that uh, if the if the rights are not available, the user will not be able to download the content. So this, the the privacy and the security part would be implemented as well. Yes. Yes. Yes, we are aware there of that work. Similarity. There is some similarity, but uh, th that uh, work is more interested in real time data download. And we are working more on uh, uh, that is real-time streaming, and we are, we are working more on content download and, uh, for example, backups and sync. Uh, along the same line of the is yes. 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 So, uh, what would we could do is we could have a, some sort of policy-driven uh, forwarding uh, process. So, if there is uh, data for for real-time application, we have sp separate policies to deal with that data. We don't store it for a longer period of time, and we try to forward it as fast as possible along the fastest path. Yes. So the, the short-term cost is what uh, uh, depend. It's basically the the most recent update you got from your routing protocol. We are discovering the route, and we we get the information about this is the cost of the route at this point. This is the short-term cost. Uh, now the long-term cost could uh, be constructed in any any way. Uh, it if you just keep a, a, the uh, history of the short-term cost along the route, and then you could e either f uh, detect a pattern, or you could take an average, or any kind of statistical information can be derived from there, and that would be the long-term cost. Yes? So it seems 
seems like your results might be somewhat sensitive to the mobility model that you're using. So how did you uh, match up your the model that you're using with uh, I don't think it would be very sensitive to the uh, mobility model because, um, uh, as I said, the post office concept is right there. Uh, if if I if the, if the network layer detects that the uh, disconnection or the root unavailability is for for a longer period of time, then it could definitely uh, it could tell the post office that this this mobile is away and it's not reachable or this net or this this person is not reachable and I have the content for it. So if you if there is a long term disconnection, it could be handled through that. I, I don't think there is any, we haven't assumed any mo mobility model. In fact, we have tried with uh, two different mobility models. One was uh, the uh, Levy Walk, which is, uh, uh, it's, it's basically the, uh, short num a large number of short walks and, uh, and a, a small number of large walks. That's the, that's the Levy, Levy Walk. We have also tried the Manhattan mobility model, and the results are uh, uh, pretty comparable. They, they don't depend upon the model. Thank you. So now we have